So, I guess we start. Thanks everybody for showing up so early. I guess we are the first talk today on the IoT Village. Um, I still need to get this somewhere near my mouth. Uh, okay, so um, I'm Daniel, this is Jiska and Caroline. And we will present our work on uh, Fitbit uh, fitness trackers. Our talk is, call our talk is called uh, Fitness Firmware Hacking, the Current State of the Heart. And this basically summarizes uh, our uh, research from the last few years. And all the work uh, we are presenting was done in the uh, Secure Mobile Networking Lab. So a brief uh, motivation. Um, a few years ago, so I guess like 2017, there was this article in the Telegraph which uh, talks about um, privacy uh, in the fitness, uh, Fitbit, uh, Fitbit uh, fitness trackers, but that's not so important. What's more important here is this comment from, from this uh, guy who says basically, please uh, modify my Fitbit so that I uh, run 10K every day. And uh, we thought, why not help this poor soul achieving his goals? <laughs> and also, um, from uh, if you look like insurance companies, you uh, will get like uh, up to here it will mention like uh, 1,500 bucks, um, like uh, bonuses if you can if you like upload your fitness data to the insurance companies to to show them that you are healthy and stuff like this. So. Um, let's start with the version comparison. So today we are going to show you several um, issues and hacks and modifications uh, that are applying to very different versions of the Fitbit. So we started with the Flex as a simple tracker um, and also the Charge HR. But um, Caroline did a lot of work um, on the Fitbit Ionic. Uh, so there will be very different um, things on top of this because the Fitbit Ionic has different interfaces which we will tell you. Apart from this, all of them are ARM based, so the architecture um, is definitely um, similar for the Flex and Charge HR and somewhat similar for the Ionic. Yeah, um, the Fitbit Ionic is the first device within Fitbit's product portfolio to be marketed as an actual smartwatch. And this is because it introduces a number of new uh, functionalities and interfaces. So for instance, it does not only have GPS or Bluetooth, it also has a Wi-Fi interface and NFC. And it has something that is called Fitbit Pay, which essentially allows you to contactlessly pay with your watch. And you can develop your own custom applications in JavaScript using, for instance, an online IDE called Fitbit Studio. And of course, it synchronizes data over Bluetooth Energy um, using some form of application, for example, on a smartphone or computer. And of course, it has a number of different sensors for capturing the user's fitness data. And you can store music files, download radio station playlists, for example, from Deezer or Pandora, and connect your Bluetooth headphones. And the Hungry Cat marks the parts of the Fitbit Ionic that we thought were the most interesting in terms of security research. So I'm now going to introduce the combination, uh, communication uh, between the uh, Fitbit and the server. And this part is very um, important for you to remember uh, to understand the remaining part of the talk. So you have a Fitbit fitness tracker. And this is connected over Bluetooth LE to the smartphone uh, app. And this connection is not that secure. So um, it's not that important that it's not so secure because the app is only forwarding this traffic uh, over HTTPS to the server and the traffic is end-to-end -end encrypted with a device uh, specific symmetric key. So each uh, Fitbit will have its own um, key, 128-bit key, um, during fabrication of it and it will be used for encryption. And this encryption only has been on uh, recent trackers only, uh, which means, well, recent, I mean, we started some years ago, so any model introduced after 2015 has encryption enabled by default, um, so you cannot disable it, but on the others you could. And then also um, there was a memory attack that was not patched uh, in all trackers. It was only patched in October 2017 on all trackers. So there were some possibilities in all the trackers to analyze this communication and plain text. 
So what is happening? Um, if you are running, so if you're Susie Fit here in the example, um, you would run and then you have steps that are recorded on the tracker um, locally. And this uh, locally stored data could be something like a week of activity data. But usually if you're connected to the smartphone app, um, this data will be transferred uh, to the server. Um, just forward it and then it will be added to the activity database and this activity database um, has this data then in plain text but you need to um, actually um, log in with your smartphone to see this data in JSON. Um, so you would get um, summaries like all the steps of the last week or something um, in JSON and the mega dumps itself, so the, the binary format from the tracker will also be answered with some settings from the server. So this is a different communication here. What you see in JSON is a different thing than what you will see in the micro dump, mega dump. And now there is a very interesting concept because um, let's, let's say I have my current step count or my heart rate and I would like to see it in the smartphone app. Um, that would be very inefficient to send it to the server each time, let the server decrypt, send it back in JSON and so on. So there is a live mode and the idea here is that the user is logging into the server, does a local pairing um, with the tracker and then there is a remote association. So each time I would log in again, I would see the data from this tracker. And the smartphone app actually in this step also gets authentication credentials. These credentials are only obtained once so that you can later use them offline. Um, so that you don't need the server for getting more data. And in this authenticated live mode, you would get um, plain text data. Um, so that, that is only the thing that you see as a summary on the display. So it's only the total step count of the day, the current heart rate, and so on. Um, and there was also the possibility for a memory readout. And since you can reuse this forever, even if you associate the tracker another time, this is kind of... Uh, a, criti a critical thing here, um, but we can also understand why they did it this way because it's for the offline usage. So it's kind of by design that you can reuse it forever. Uh, so Caroline is now going to tell you about the additions on the Ionic smartwatch. So as I've said, um, the Fitbit Ionic introduces new functionality and has new interfaces that have not been there in previous trackers. And for this reason, um, the communication paradigm has also been a bit modified. What remains largely the same is um, pretty much things like so-called server dumps. This is something that Diska already told you about. It's essentially a generalization of micro and mega dumps. And they are sent from the Fitbit service over the Fitbit smartphone application to the Fitbit smartwatch. And also the entire communication on top of Bluetooth Energy is very similar. But there are also some new concepts. For example, something that we called app dumps that I'm going to talk to you about um, later on in more detail. And the Fitbit Ionics Wi-Fi interface is used during um, the installation of a custom application, mainly for WebSocket traffic and also for downloading firmware during a firmware update. And that's pretty much it. Everything else is still relayed over the smartphone application. And the NFC and interface is only used for the transmission of payment traffic to and from a payment terminal. And of course, as I've said, you can connect your Bluetooth headphones using Bluetooth. Okay, so one important step uh, during our research was accessing the hardware. Um, you can start with disassembling the app, of course, or um, taking dumps from, I don't know, HTTPS. But to get a whole picture, you, uh, we thought we also want to, getting, uh, to get access to the hardware itself. So um, to quickly um, show you our uh, thread model, so we still have SUSE Fit. Uh, who stores her activity locally on her tracker. And of course, this tracker has a local symmetric uh, device key. And, but now what happens uh, if Susie is not so um, yeah, uh, active anymore and more, uh, likes to modify her own data or uh, get her own data? Uh, so our goals are to access the uh, local data storage and to get the encryption keys. So the first stuff you do, of course, is to search for eBay and buy all the trackers you, you get your hands on. And um, so in our case, uh, the Fitbit Flex was pretty cheap uh, already. So uh, broken ones you could get uh, up into uh, batches of 20 for uh, $1 each. 
And um, so here's a quick uh, look at the uh, um, hardware and software of the, uh, fit, uh, of the Fitbit Flex. So uh, you have your uh, main system on a chip. Um, you have, uh, which in this case is a chip from STM. It runs a Cortex uh, M3 ARM. And the firmware um, consists of uh, a few libraries which we identified they, they used. So for encryption, for example, they used uh, libtomcrypt. And for BLE, they used a library which is very similar to libble shield. And of course, uh, apart from the main SOC, you also have your uh, Bluetooth um, chip, which is from Nordic Semiconductors, and an, an accelerometer. And here in the Fitbit Flex example, uh, everything is connected via a new R bus. So if you pry open the hardware, so this is uh, pretty easy on the Fitbit Flex. You just use a heating gun, uh, heat it up, and then you can basically uh, pull it apart, and you will get to the PCB. So here we already removed the battery um, and the vibration sensor uh, or vibration actuator. And so you already see that there are uh, many testing points, and the most important ones are these. So uh, TP8 and 9 are used for SWD debugging and you can use just the ground from the um, from the battery to connect it to your debugger. And apart from this there is also TP10 which you can use for resetting and yeah that's it. Then you're already uh, you have everything you need to uh, hook it up to a debugger. And so here on the right hand side this is how it looked in our case. We just used the um, ST-Link debugger from STM and in the breadboard basically. And with this we were already able to um, read out the, all the memory. So um, it, is basic, it consists of three big parts, the a flash, an EEPROM and an SRAM. The uh, flash contains of course all the firmware code, the EEPROM stores all the data you uh, want to get your hands on, and the uh, SRAM of course for uh, firmware variables. Um, if you have a closer look the, uh, at the flash, uh, you will see that it consists of two big parts, um, an app part and an BSL part. Iska will uh, tell you more about these later, uh, but the important thing is that they can run independently from each other. And the uh, EEPROM, uh, as I said, uh, contains all your fitness data, but also like uh, the serial number of the Fitbit, an encryption key, and an encryption switch. So with this switch, it was possible to disable uh, encryption completely. But nowadays, the backend will not accept uh, connections which are not encrypted anymore. So this does not work anymore. Um, so one important step also was to re-enable GDB access. Um, what we discovered is basically that um, you only were able to connect to the uh, Fitbit uh, if you did a reset before this. And uh, after this, if you hit continue on your GDB, uh, the tracker will, uh, basically the, the connection to the debugger will be lost. So at some point in time, it needs to, uh, apparently it um, remaps the GPIO ports to something else, but not like to uh, something which we need for debugging. So we thought, why not uh, reset them to something which we actually need? And what we used for this is the Nextmon patching framework. So we already developed this for a previous uh, project, and with this framework, we are able to binary patch um, the stuff, basically, and we adapted it for our needs. Um, of course, our goal was to modify the firmware and enable the uh, dynamic debugging. So this is what the core graph looks like for uh, after ini initialization. So uh, at the beginning, uh, GDP access still works, and somewhere after the initialization, it doesn't work anymore. So uh, I have no idea where exactly these GPIO pins are uh, reassigned, but I, I actually don't need to know. So. Um, what, I, what we just did instead is to add an additional Bluetooth command to remap the GPIO ports uh, to uh, re-enable uh, GDP access. And for this, we, um, yeah, we, uh, we did this with an, an, a special Bluetooth command because we did not know uh, what they, uh, for out of which other use case they, they had for this GPIO pins. And we just wanted to keep the side effects as uh, yeah, small as possible. 
Okay, and with this, of course, then we were able to have breakpoints and memory watch points and all the good stuff. So naturally, we also had to look at the Fitbit Ionix hardware. And we did this by using two broken Fitbit Ionix smartwatches. And the goal was for us to understand the hardware that is used and also to find possibilities for debugging. And what you see on the picture below is the Fitbit Ionix main PCB being powered by its battery pack. Um, and it has 39 copper wires soldered to its back and is connected to a logic analyzer. And since the Fitbit Ionix main PCB is rather small, this entire setup always reminds me of the flying spaghetti monster. Um, what you see in this picture are all the hardware markings that we deciphered from the chips on the Fitbit Ionix main PCB using a microscope. And what you see from this is that the Fitbit Ionix uses a Cypress Bluetooth chip, a um, Broadcom Wi-Fi, and an NXP NFC chip. And also the CPU and the flash memory are manufactured by Toshiba. And the CPU is custom built for wearables and smartwatches. And uh, it contains an ARM Cortex-M4. And it does not have JTAG interface, but instead uses SWD, which is short for Serial Wired Debug. And on the right-hand side, you see a comparison of the Fitbit Ionix main PCB to the main PCB of the Fitbit Flex. And what is noticeable is that the Fitbit Ionix has a lot more stuff going on on the PCB, and um, it's a lot more densely packed and more complex. So there's definitely an involvement there. This is the main PCB from the back um, with all the different testing points. There are 95 in sum, and we tested 39 of them using the logic analyzer under different conditions. And we wanted to identify which, which testing points correlate to the SWD interface. Unfortunately, um, Murphy's Law, <laughs> this did not uh, yield the desired result. Instead, we found that testing points 25 and 28 are um, responsible for SWD clock and input output, respectively, after we disordered the main CPU. So if you want to follow up on this, these are the testing points to look for. And this is what the flash memory and the main um, CPU look like desoldered. And the interesting thing to note about the flash memory is that we were not able to find any information on the public internet about the manufacturer parts number on this chip. We found one that was very similar, that had just one letter exchanged essentially, but it was bigger. And um, this is why we think that it might be possible that this chip is even custom built for the Fitbit Ionic. So um, the thing is that it is not that practical to open up um, a Fitbit to then change your step count or whatsoever. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do is also to understand the wireless um, firmware flashing process to um, flash our own uh, firmware that modifies something. So the firmware update process usually works as follows. You just have the same mega dump um, synchronization um, with the server, and the server realizes, hey, I have a new firmware, and then this firmware is actually uh, shown to the user, and the user needs to confirm to do a firmware update, and then again, the tracker is sending a micro dump, and there is the firmware request to the server, and the answer to this um, contains two parts, which Daniel was already talking about, a BSL and an app. So app here is not smartphone application, but the main application running on the um, Fitbit tracker. And first, the BSL is flashed, validated, and so on. And then there's a reboot to BSL, and then the same happens to the app. So the idea is that you cannot prick your tracker, um, which means, so if I cannot reboot to um, uh, BSL, then my BSL was wrong, and then I can still boot the app. So far, so good. Um, another thing that you need to understand uh, for trackers that ha still have a memory readout um, attack but do encryption is uh, how the encryption itself works. So we did a bit of reverse engineering um, and found that um, the um, tracker is using libtomcrypt, and with this it was also easier to find out um, how the nonce is used, how the encryption key is used, and that they have a Mac. So the Mac also means that you cannot easily flip 
a, a bit here and there to um, change the behavior because then in the end um, it will no longer uh, match with the authentication Mac. So you really need to understand um, how the format works and how the encryption works. So um, if you want to flash a modified firmware, um, first of all you need to get the encryption key or you have a tracker that is still in plain text. Um, you can achieve that actually if you buy one of the older trackers and never connect it to the internet. So beginning of this year I was still buying trackers that could be modified um, but only the very old models and then you need to find someone buying one of those models that has never been unpacked. So. Um, if you have the key, you can then also read out the firmware. If it's not already a firmware that we, we already have, then you can copy the firmware, um, modify it with Nexmon, and copy it back to the smartphone app. Um, our app actually already has a few firmware images built in, so if you just want to have one of the images that we provide, you don't need to do this part, but um, probably you are interested in binary patching and want to have your own patches. Um, and then you need again uh, to format and encrypt the firmware and flash it back as I explained. Um, and yeah, so uh, the pre-compiled firmware that we have has a couple of funny features. So the first feature um, we actually did um, when we had our uh, first demo. Um, so when we gave our first talk and it is uh, just returning the step counts times 100. Um, so you need to do less points. Um, and it will still look somewhat realistic to the server, so you could do some more advanced stuff here like replaying uh, activity records or something, but, but we just do the steps times 100. Um, and another funny thing that happens, so if you then are resetting the tracker that has this patch and already have a high step count, then it is like taking the square of this or something, so it's getting like super high numbers. And this is really funny because then if you have a Fitbit account in your inbox, you will have like all the notifications of like, um, you got the no New Zealand badge of crossing all of New Zealand in one day and so on, I don't know. Um, so that's, that's really funny what happens if you do this. And yeah, you definitely don't need to do any more sports. Um, maybe you shouldn't do too much of this because if you have a health insurance and want to tell the health insurance I'm doing sports and then they are like, yes, but you did like uh, two billion steps, then it might be strange. So be careful with this. Um, and then beginning of this year, I also ported this code to the Fitbit Charge HR, um, which is also cool because the Fitbit Charge HR has a display. And uh, display means that you can impress your friends without uh, taking the smartphone app with you. So you can just show like, oh, I did a lot of steps today. Just I, I was doing sports before coming to your party. And then you don't need to move a lot on the party because otherwise they will think like, how did you do 5,000 steps on a party? Okay, so um, the accelerometer is one thing that we thought is very interesting to access because there is like, or at least has been no good uh, tools with um, trackers that are waterproof and still for experimentation to get accelerometer readings. Um, and there is almost no strings in the firmware, so it's very hard to reverse engineer. But one thing that is there is a uh, factory test mode with some basic console. And luckily, so one of the very few things that has a string is a command to test the accelerometer. Um, and with this we found out how the accelerometer is configured um, and the most important part is the accelerometer is configured um, to make measurements with a rate of 100 hertz, so 100 measurements per second. I think this type of um, accelerometer can also be configured differently, so to something like 2 kilohertz, which would mean that you could also record um, or recognize some speech with this, um, but the 100 hertz is totally sufficient um, for uh, recognizing some gestures and movements. Um, actually, already something like 25 hertz would be okay, so the question is could we get the readings of the accelerometer somehow out of the tracker with at least a rate of 25 hertz? Um, and the next problem is a bit that we are restricted in how to patch this because we do binary patching, which means um, writing code from scratch aside, it's easier to reuse existing functions. Um, so what we did is um, we made a switch into the live mode, so we are using the live mode, um, and then we are copying the XYZ uh, values to the live mode, um, and 
the um, rate of this is the uh, Bluetooth LE packet rate and so you can put out uh, the, the readings with something like 66 hertz so it's like not as much as the original readings but it's still sufficient um, if you want to develop something that recognizes movements um, and the use cases are various so for example you could now um, develop your own um, algorithms that do something with uh, accelerometers so recognize I don't know some gestures on top of uh, step counts um, and this you could do with Python or whatever you like on, on your uh, smartphone in Java whatever and then once you have all the logic of how to recognize those movements you can then uh, port it back to C code with Nexmon because putting out the readings over Bluetooth is straining the battery a lot so it's nothing to do uh, forever but at least for development it's very interesting. So the versions that you can modify is actually if you buy Fitbit One, Flex or Charge HR that has never ever been updated so a fresh one from the internet um, or if you updated it like only very 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 long time ago so something like uh, it was never updated since October 2017. Um, and the Charge HR uh, would also allow you to access the heart rate sensor, so there's also some help commands with this, but we didn't uh, release a patch for this so far, but if someone is very interested, we can look into this, of course. Yeah, so, so much about the trackers, and now we are going to tell you more about the new smartwatch. Okay. Um. As Giska said, I'll be switching back to the Fitbit Ionic for a bit and tell you about some of the insights that we gained during testing. So, as I've already mentioned, the most interesting parts of the Fitbit Ionic from our point of view um, are Fitbit Pay, the custom application installation capability, as well as the way that uh, the Ionic synchronizes data. Synchronization is very interesting because we found that it heavily relies on the old Fitbit ecosystem and reuses old functionality, and we wanted to see whether all the old vulnerabilities are still present there. Um, one thing to know about custom applications is that um, the process of installing heavily relies on the Wi-Fi interface and for this um, Fitbit consistently uses TLS and sometimes, for example, during the download of firmware they even use mutually authenticated TLS using server and client certificates so it's rather hard to get in between the communication or modify communication. Um, so I'll skip applications and focus on Fitbit Pay as well as synchronization in the next couple of slides. So one thing that I've uh, talked quite a bit about already is Bluetooth for Energy and as the name suggests it is closely related to Bluetooth yet a bit different because it has been designed for energy constraint devices. It operates on the 2.4 gigahertz frequency and performs frequency hopping on 40 channels of which 37 are used for data transmission. The generic attribute profile is another layer within the Bluetooth Energy protocol stack and it groups related information into services and characteristics and the smallest bit of information on um, this layer is called an attribute, hence the name generic attribute profile. So the Fitbit Ionic uses Bluetooth for Energy 4.2 which is the latest Bluetooth for Energy version despite stating otherwise on the official website which is weird, it says 4.0 on the website and Bluetooth for Energy is not known for being the most secure standard by design. Um, there is one pairing method called Just Works, which um, essentially is the most unsecure pairing method that you could use because it does not use authentication and depending on the Bluetooth for Energy version you can also launch active or passive eavesdropping and man in the middle attacks. And this is precisely what the Fitbit Ionic uses. Um, it enforces the use of just works pairing. You cannot use anything else with your smartwatch. And we assume that this is due to usability issues because it does not require user interaction. Also, the Fitbit Ionic exposes five different services on the generic attribute profile layer. And two of those services are proprietary and these are used by Fitbit to layer their own application layer protocol on top. And this application layer protocol is what I'd like to um, dive a bit into in the next couple of slides. Um, some things are legacy and are, have already been present in previous trackers and some things are new and specific to the Fitbit Ionic. 
So one thing Yiska already mentioned um, is the so-called live data, which is uh, the real-time fitness information of a user. And this is uh, still included and present on the Fitbit Ionic. Um, it is not protected in any way on the application layer and sent between the smartwatch and the Ionic. Another um, type of data that is present on this application layer protocol is so-called command messages. They either instruct the receiving side to take a certain action or a signal state. Um, and there have been modifications to previous ones or older ones from older trackers um, for the Fitbit Ionic. And there are also a couple of new ones that have been introduced. And they are also not protected on the application layer and exchanged between the smartwatch and the Fitbit, uh, yeah, the Fitbit application. One thing that is new to the Fitbit Ionic are something that we called app dumps. Um, app dumps because they are exchanged between the Fitbit application and the Fitbit Ionic, and they are encrypted dumps, um, encrypted blobs of data. Um, they are encrypted using AES in EAX mode, using a symmetric key, of course. And this key is derived using a proprietary session key derivation protocol that has been designed by Fitbit. We reverse engineered this protocol. And unfortunately for us, um, we did not find a practical exploit, but only a theoretical attack on this protocol because it has two independent stages. And the semantics of the app dumps are defined in a construct that is called the Fitbit Mobile Data Protocols, which essentially is a set of XML files that define which bit and um, byte within a protocol byte stream means what exactly. And the normal thing about app dumps is that it's the first time that the application and the Fitbit um, tracker or smartwatch has the capability of exchanging encrypted blobs of data. Previously, this was only present um, or possible between the Fitbit tracker and the Fitbit servers. And if you're interested how all of this works, I have a little Python script that demonstrates a little um, proof of concept to show you how um, app dumps work and how the session key derivation protocol works. And last but not least, um, I've already mentioned this, server dumps are still present on the Fitbit Ionic. They are exchanged between the Fitbit servers and the smartwatch. And they are also encrypted blobs of data using a symmetric key. And if you want to get to that data, you either have to um, hack the Fitbit servers or your Fitbit Ionic because that's where the keys are. It is completely transparent to the Fitbit mobile application. And for the Fitbit Ionic, the server dump header has been modified. Another thing that we looked into is the Fitbit Pay, uh, Fitbit Pay capability. And when I heard that you could now pay with your smartwatch, I had really high, high hopes that it would be really insecure so I could find a lot of things. Um, you can use Fitbit Pay if you have a supported credit or debit card by one of the banks listed on Fitbit's website. For instance, um, the Bank of America is supported or the German Landesbank Baden-Württemberg and all the payment traffic is transmitted on the NFC interface, which means it is all transmitted wirelessly, and the implementation is according to the EMV standard or EMV specifications, and EMV is short for Europe International, MasterCard, and Visa, and those are just three organizations that work together to create a common um, specification for credit card payments. Um, the credit card information is managed using the Fitbit mobile application and for this purpose Fitbit registered a new web API that is located under the domain payables.co. And we focused on um, analyzing the payment traffic and to do this we used an, an app that is called NFC Gate which has been developed within the CMO research group, the Secure um, Mobile Networking Lab. And if you're interested in sniffing your own um, payment traffic using this very cost-effective setup, you can go to the link below of this slide, which is nfc.wtf. And um, what NFC Gate does essentially is it creates a Wi-Fi wormhole. So the first um, app on the first smartphone captures the NFC traffic from the Fitbit Ionic, sends it via Wi-Fi to the NFC Gate server that is also able to lock the traffic. And from there, the traffic will be um, relayed to the other NFC Gate app where um, the data is sent via NFC to its destination, which in this case is the payment terminal and vice versa. Okay, so um, after analyzing um, and experimenting with this, we found, um, unfortunately for us, that it is um, rather secure in terms of what is recommended in the EMV standard. So for instance, um, something that is called tokenization is used during payment, which means that your credit card number is never transmitted in plain text. Instead, it is uh, replaced with a so-called token, which essentially is a pseudonym for your credit card. 
um, number. Also, a so-called authorization request cryptogram is used, which is a MAC that is um, computed, among other things, over the transaction details using a session key that is derived from the credit card's master key and a transaction counter. And what this does is that the transaction cannot be modified or replayed. And last but not least, a four-digit PIN is used as soon as you decide to set up Fitbit Pay, which is supposed to lessen the probability of someone else paying with your watch. And it is also used during a process that is called consumer device cardholder verification, which proves your identity as a cardholder towards the payment terminal. And uh, to sum all of this up, um, the security when paying with your Fitbit Ionic is pretty much the same than paying with your contactless uh, plastic credit card. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and next I would like to dive a bit into um, all the vulnerabilities that we found on the Bluetooth interface, which is something that we um, dedicated a bit more time to. And for this purpose, I grouped all the vulnerabilities we identified in two categories. On the left-hand side, you see all the vulnerabilities that are new to the Fitbit Ionic and have not been present in previous trackers. And on the right-hand side, you see the vulnerabilities that are due to legacy implementations and have been known to be present in previous trackers. And what is pretty obvious is that the right-hand side is much larger. There's much more vulnerabilities. And this is because Fitbit relies on its old ecosystem and has a need for backwards compatibility. So they reuse a lot of um, old stuff and implementations. And this, of course, causes all the old vulnerabilities to still be present. Instead of explaining each and every one of those vulnerabilities, I'd just like to point out the main points of criticism that we have here and that are, or that essentially cause all of these vulnerabilities. So one thing that I've already talked to you about, of course, is the weak Bluetooth low energy pairing that just works pairing method. Um, and also we found that Bluetooth low energy security is inconsistently enforced. This means um, once the connection is set up between your Fitbit Ionic and the smartphone application, um, Bluetooth low energy or pairing does not instantly kick in. Instead, it takes some time until pairing happens. And during this time, all of your data will be transmitted in plain text which of course is not that great. So our recommendation would be to use secure connections whenever possible, which is present in Bluetooth 4.2, and use a pairing um, method that uses authentication. Also, Yiska already said um, there is a problem with reusable authentication credentials for live data, and this problem is still present on the Fitbit Ionic. So if an attacker, through whichever means, acquires those authentication credentials, they will forever be able to request live data from your smartwatch. And of course, this is also something that you do definitely not want. So the reuse of those authentication credentials should be prevented, for example, by associating them with a validity period, or if that's not possible, maybe just plainly store the last used authentication credentials because they are usually not swapped out that often. Um, another problem that persists is that live data is not protected on the application layer. And this is a problem if you use uh, a weak Bluetooth low energy pairing method, as uh, the Fitbit Ionic does, or if um, at the beginning of each connection the traffic is not instantly protected. So our recommendation at this point would be to encrypt live data with a similar um, mechanism that app thumbs are protected with. And this, of course, would introduce some additional delays or your um, real-time data would not be entirely real-time anymore, but security has never been convenient. So. And last but not least, I also found some testing commands to be present in production. For example, I found a uh, command that allows you, which is one command, to request a very large test dump. It's just meaningless test data, but it's rather large. And I was uh, able to keep the Fitbit Ionic sending for 45 minutes straight. You could keep this um, for even longer. And what it does is that it drains the Fitbit Ionic's battery quite quickly. And for whatever reason, the UI becomes very sluggish and unresponsive, so you can't really use your smartwatch anymore. And that's just pretty much unnecessary, so our recommendation would be to employ a process that ensures that all your testing code is not rolled out to production, which is probably something that is a standard in software development. Okay. So to conclude our talk, um, we have three major points which we uh, want to, to point out. So uh, in general, we can say that uh, Fitbit products improved a lot uh, during the, the years which we uh, observed them. Um, uh, in general, they have the problem of compatibility. 
uh, for older trackers, so the app uh, still needs to uh, have this legacy protocol, uh, which uh, needs to talk via Bluetooth. And in general, um, it seems that Fitbit just likes to uh, impl implement uh, encryption in weird ways. So that's it from our side. Um, thanks for your time. And I guess we have now some time for Q&A. Questions? Um, so the question was uh, if we already looked into the app, right? So um, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so we looked into the app. Um, so Caroline did it and me too um, for understanding, for example, how the firmware is slashed and so on. And um, we patched the APK and made some uh, debug prints and so on to get an idea of what is going on. Oh, yeah? Okay, so the question was um, with the secure connections and the pairing, uh, how it works and why it kicks in later. So I do not know why, but I would expect that you pair or um, use um, a secure encrypted connection before you exchange any data between the smartwatch and the application, and this just doesn't happen. They exchange data for a couple of seconds, and then randomly um, pairing starts. I don't know why, but I've uh, seen this quite a lot when testing. Yeah. Ah, so the question was if we also looked into other smartwatches. So actually, another group at our university initially did a study on uh, fitness trackers in general. I think that was back in 2017 or so, or 2016. And they bought something like 16, 17 um, trackers, different kinds. And what they found out is that most IoT fitness trackers do not even encrypt the data. Um, so we actually picked Fitbit because we thought it's like a very interesting ecosystem. They have encryption and so on. Um, so it's like we are hacking the, the, the strongest implementation. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, so the question is, um, there is some Fitbits with GPS. I think it's the Fitbit Surge or something. Um, but that one has been produced after 2015, so it's encrypted. Um, and then it's harder to do it. So um, that's why we just went then straight to the Ionic to see what changed. Um, I assume that some stuff would be similar. So if you would open the PCB and so on, then you could maybe extract the firmware again. Um, but then you only have access to this one tracker uh, with the one encryption key that is on this very same tracker. Uh, and that's a lot of effort uh, for just hacking one device. OK, then thank you for listening. We will be around here for a bit more if you have any questions also on uh, like how we patch the firmware, for example. That might be interesting for some of you. Uh, yeah, thank you.